mother. I can hardly believe it's been a fortnight since I bade you all farewell. I miss you terribly, yet my heart is also filled with delicious anticipation of the new life which awaits father and me in the colonies. I look forward to settling in Dr. Franklin's home in Philadelphia and long to see father again when he returns from the wilderness. Proud to have a brave explorer as my father. I wear his locket always. We'll all be reunited on the wonderful land he is sure to discover. I shall be true to my word and write every day. Your loving daughter, Sarah. <gasps> Again, James. Afraid so, Moses. Help me. This is my last clean shirt. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Much obliged. Dr. Franklin has warned you about standing too close to the press while I'm working on it. Look at yourself. Fantastic. When someone wants to know what's on my shirt, I can sell them a newspaper. We're paid to print the paper, not wear it. I don't just print the paper. I'm a journalist. You're an apprentice journalist. True, but someday I'm going to get the big story. Then Dr. Franklin will make me a full-fledged journalist. James! Moses! Huh? A letter! Uh, it's from Dr. Franklin in London. Give me that, Henri. It's addressed to Moses. You look like James. And you look like someone whose dessert I'm gonna eat tonight. Lads, drop everything. Sarah Phillips isn't coming to Philadelphia. Good. I never understood why she had to stay here anyway. Fetch your coats. We're going to meet her at the ship. I thought you just said she isn't coming to Philadelphia. She's not. Dr. Franklin says Miss Phillips couldn't make passage on the Dover. She's aboard the Dartmouth, and the Dartmouth is heading for Boston. Boston? That's in Massachusetts Bay Colony. And there's been trouble up there lately. We have to hurry. She's all alone. Come on. I hope I'm not putting you out of your way, Dr. Franklin. Not at all, Lady Phillips. I have an appointment just down the street. Besides, life's a wilderness without friends. Last night, I had a terrible dream. My Sarah was in danger. Danger in Philadelphia? <laughs> Let me put your mind at ease. It's a fine city, the second largest in the Empire. She'll feel very much at home, Lady Phillips. That is a relief. I worry about her, Ben. With Major Phillips off scouting new lands in the Ohio Territory, Sarah will be all alone. But she won't be alone. She'll be in fine company with my associates Moses, James, and Henri. Sarah couldn't be safer if she were still cradled in your own arms. Gentlemen of Boston, the hour has arrived. Please, please. Gentlemen, you know me as Sam Adams, neighbor and friend. Hear me now. Parliament continues to treat us with ill will. First, the Sugar Act raised our taxes. Did we have a say? The answer is nay. Then, the Horrid Stamp Act nearly drove us to ruin. And who can forget our brothers who lost their lives in the Boston Massacre? Yeah! Yeah! And now, Governor Hutchinson insists on collecting Parliament's tea tax. But did we have a vote? No! no! Yeah. 
So, this is Boston. It's smaller than I thought. Oh, my joints are aching from these rotten roads. The axle is bent. It'll have to be repaired before we head back. The ride home will be smoother. Good. Otherwise, I'd rather walk home. How are we going to find Miss Phillips? You don't even know what she looks like. She sailed on the Dartmouth. That's a good place to start. Time for us to band together as Sons of Liberty. <laughs> it's time for us to become patriots. <laughs> and patriots are men of action. Are you with me? <laughs> Let's go. Yellow hair? There's a story here. Let's see where they lead us. They're headed for the Dartmouth. We've got to find Miss Phillips, fast. Get this story. Just the tea, men. Remember, we're not to damage anything else. We're just after the tea. Why are you destroying the tea? We're protesting unfair taxation. Parliament raised the tea tax over our objections. Maybe next time they'll listen. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Nope, I heard the others saying it. We've stumbled into the story of a lifetime. I'm going below deck to see what's happening. Stay out of trouble. Take that, Parliament! <laughs> Miss Phillips! Sarah Phillips! Sarah! Hit me. You'll never take me alive. Take you? Where? Wherever Indians take people. I'm not no Indian. None of us are. You're not an Indian. Who taught you grammar? Who taught you to whack people in the head? My apologies. I thought you were here to kidnap me. Kidnap? I'm a journalist for the Pennsylvania Gazette. Now, what do you have to say about the tax protest? Is that what this is about? Disgraceful. The tea is private property. This is so uncivilized. We're not to damage anything else. We're just after the tea. If you are any kind of Englishman, you drop that pencil and put a stop to it. So you think it's okay to impose taxes on the colonies, even though the colonies don't have a vote in Parliament? I think loyal subjects of the king should obey the laws of their country. And you can quote me on that. Mr. What is your name? Hiller. James Hiller. And who would I be quoting? Whom may I be quoting? If you're going to write for a newspaper, you really should treat words with more care. Just tell me your name, will you? I have work to do. Phillips. Miss Sarah Phillips of London, England. S A R A H P H I. Sarah Phillips? You're Sarah Phillips? Sarah Phillips. 
not. I am. And I'll thank you to stop shouting, Mr. Hiller. I've had a very rude welcome to America, and you're not making things any better. We've been looking for you. Have you? And why is that? Benjamin Franklin sent us. Dr. Franklin sent you? Now who's yelling? Redcoats! <laughs> Abandon ship! Abandon ship! <laughs> Henri, we have to get out of here. Where is James? Look, it is not a mistake. <gasps> James, come on. The Redcoats are on their way. Come on! Unhand me! Ugh. Miss huh? Phillips, I presume. Thank goodness we found you. If we're caught by those soldiers, we'll be thrown in jail. Which, in my opinion, is exactly where traitors belong. Sorry, Miss Phillips, but I oh. can't print my story from jail. Let me go! I said let me go! I'd love to, but Dr. Franklin told us to take care of you. James, look out! <gasps> you for this! You rough scallions! Men, stop them immediately! I want them now! Whoa! Shh! Is everyone okay? That was fun! What a story! This is headline news! Shh! Lower your voices! We're not out of the woods yet! Are you crazy? Do you want the British to catch us? I am British. We're all British. Right now, those soldiers think we're criminals. Criminals? What did we do wrong? We were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The wagon's over there. Let's go. Keep down. The Redcoats will recognize you three, but I'll just be another faceless servant. Even if you don't like the laws, you can't just ignore them. That will lead to chaos. But what if the law is unjust? Parliament would never pass an unjust law. But they have. I interviewed the men tonight. The colonies must pay taxes to the king, but we have no voice in Parliament. Does that sound fair to you? I don't know what to think. I only know Ben Franklin would hardly approve of what went on tonight. Then you don't know Ben Franklin. Quick! Get down, the constable! Be still, or it's jail for us all. Oh! Whoa! Good evening, constable. Fine night. Fine night for troublemakers. State your business. I'm just bringing some freshly quartered hogs to the Wheatley residence. Hogs, say you? At this time of night? I think I'll have myself a look. I wouldn't if I were you. These are some big, ugly hogs. Nasty to look at. And do they ever smell? You're right. They do stink. The Wheatley home is right around the corner. Hurry along now. The Redcoats have Boston under curfew. Nobody's allowed on the streets after dark. Won't happen again. Much obliged, sir. <clears throat> this is the place. Come on. Moses, how do you know the Wheatleys? You've never been to Boston. I don't know the Wheatleys, but all of my people know Phyllis Wheatley. Oh. From her poetry. She's the finest poet in the land. Muse, where shall I begin the spacious field to tell what curses unbelief doth yield? A woman who can write like that would never turn away someone who needs help. Why are we at the servant's door? Yes. Miss Wheatley? Yes. We're in trouble, Miss Wheatley. And we are hungry. Did Mr. Adams send you? Um, yes? There's a stable round back. The door squeaks, so be careful. We can't wake the master. You're a slave? When I was eight years old, I was kidnapped in West Africa and taken on a slave ship to Boston. 
The Wheatleys paid for me in the auction and took me home. Mrs. Wheatley helped me learn to read. Not just English, but also Latin and Greek. Please, go on. Well, a few years ago, all of the reading gave me an urge to start writing poetry. And soon thereafter, my first book was published. It has gotten a rather good response in England, though very few copies have been sold in the colonies. That's not surprising. And maybe you should have put pictures in it. The Wheatleys have helped me greatly. They even sent me to London. But I don't understand. You're still a slave. My situation is very different than most. The Wheatleys and I belong to the Old South Church. It is our hope that through meeting Africans, white people will realize how wrong slavery is. I'd love to read your book. I'm afraid you'll not be reading it now, Miss Phillips. We'd best get undercover before someone sees us. Go, I'll bring some vittles. We'll never make it back to Philadelphia on this axle. It has to be replaced. Good. I like to stick around Boston. This is where the action is. Oh, me too. If Miss Wheatley can write half as good as she cooks, she must be another Shakespeare. <laughs> hey! How can a woman like Phyllis Wheatley be somebody's property? It's outrageous. Am I the only one who sees this? Those men tonight throwing tea into the water, all that talk of freedom. What about freedom for Miss Wheatley? Not everyone in the colonies believes in slavery, Sarah. Talk is easy. And freedom is priceless. I know. I was born free in West Africa. But when I was not much bigger than little Henri here, my brother and I were captured and chained to the decks of a ship, an awful ship with a long voyage to Virginia and slavery. That's terrible, Moses. How did you escape? I escaped by using my head and my hands. I learned smithing, a valuable skill. My master loaned me out for odd jobs here and there, and sometimes I was given silver coins for my work. When I earned enough coins, I bought my freedom back and traveled to Philadelphia. There, I learned to read and write and was offered a job by Dr. Franklin, a man who hates slavery as much as I. But Moses, how can you support those rebels? In England, slavery is dying. Here it's thriving. I believe America's struggle is like my own. The colonists consider themselves enslaved to a master they did not choose. And that's a fight. If it comes to fighting, I will not duck. <gasps> I'll fight you for that drumstick. Hey! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's very late. We should get some sleep. Good night, all. Father, I pray you are safe. I pray you will return from the West so we can be a family again. My locket! It's gone! Mother, so much has happened since I have arrived, I barely know where to start. I'm so confused. These Americans speak of liberty and freedom for all, but deny it to those with skin different from their own. I only hope that everything will be all right once Dr. Franklin arrives, and I trust that all is well with him. Dear Sarah, if only you knew. Benjamin Franklin, the great Dr. Franklin. Friend of humanity, inventor of the lightning rod, father of electricity, author of Poor Richard's Almanac, deputy postmaster general of North America. Yes, he is all these things, but he is something more. He is a traitor! No, 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 I charge Dr. Franklin with instigating the Boston Tea Party. 
The East India Company lost hundreds of crates of tea worth many thousands of pounds. This lawlessness was encouraged by Dr. Franklin in his speeches and writings. His crimes are enormous. And for his crime, he must pay the price. <laughs> Make an example of Franklin that the colonists will never forget. Dearest Mother, they called it the Boston Tea Party, but believe me, this is one party I wish I had missed. The Yankees claim all this trouble is over taxes. Why are you destroying the tea? We're protesting unfair taxation. Parliament raised the tea tax over our objections. Maybe next time they'll listen. Ruffians cowardly disguised as Mohawk Indians destroyed a shipment of tea. No taxation without representation! Redcoats! Abandon ship! Abandon ship! Sorry, Miss Phillips, but oh. I can't print my story from jail. Let me go! I said let me go! I'd love to, but Dr. Franklin told us to take care of you. James, look out! In a struggle, I lost Father's locket. I'm very angry. America is a strange, strange place. I can't say that I like what I've seen of it. We live in a barn hiding from His Majesty's soldiers. Sheltered by a remarkable woman, a poet and slave named Phyllis Wheatley. <laughs> James, Henri, and Moses support these radicals, but I, for one, can't wait to leave Boston. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sorry, Caesar. I won't brush so hard. Hey! Allow me. Uh. When is Dr. Franklin coming? Soon, I hope. Very soon. Your loyal, loving daughter, Sarah. How many do you see, Henri? One, two, three, four, five. English, Henri, not French. I'm counting the English. How many are there now? Too many. There mustn't be a soldier left in England. What should we do? What should we do? The British are occupying Boston. I've got to get this to the Gazette right away. Come on, Henri. On the evening of 16 December, the year of our Lord, 1773, cowardly bandits disguised as Indians attacked the Dartmouth, a ship flying the colors of His Majesty King George III. And who is responsible for inflaming the subjects of Boston to this violence? None other than the man before us, the esteemed Benjamin Franklin. <gasps> His crimes are enormous. The East India Company lost hundreds of crates of tea worth many thousands of pounds. This lawlessness was encouraged by Dr. Franklin in his speeches and writings. His inflammatory paper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, continues to foment sedition Rebellion, violence, treason! You have no honor, sir! You are a scoundrel, sir! Have you nothing to say for yourself? The heart of a fool is in his mouth, but the mouth of a wise man is in his heart. Ah, the famous Franklin wit. Perhaps I need to remind you, a rope is the proper reward for treason. 
Closed. Hundreds of new soldiers arrived by ship this morning. The whole city is filled with redcoats! <gasps> Would you please mind your tongue? Where's my pencil? I have a story to write. This is headline news. Ahem, <clears throat> James. Those filthy redcoats are everywhere. That's right, James. After that long sea voyage, these lovely red coats could use a good cleaning. <gasps> this may need some soap and water. Let me help you, Miss Phillips. Fine morning, isn't it? Tis you who could use the soap and water in that smart mouth of yours. You're absolutely right. You'll have to forgive my manners. I'm an orphan. I was raised on the streets and sometimes forget my place. Where's that grub we was promised? I'll check on it right away, sir. Why don't you come give me a hand in the kitchen? The kitchen? That's woman's work. H hey! The kitchen! Of course! It would be an honor to help, m'lady. What are redcoats doing in the barn? It's called quartering. A soldier just knocks on your door anytime, day or night, and moves into your house. We have five more upstairs. I can't believe King George would allow that. It was Parliament's doing. They call it the Coercive Acts. The Intolerable Acts would be more like it. This is an outrage. That's right. We have to cook for them, wash their clothes, and they don't have to pay a single shilling. I am outraged, too. This pie was too small. You are the funny one, aren't you? How did you come to be in the colonies? I came here with my parents. Henri was six years old when he left France with his parents. They signed an agreement with the ship's captain to work for seven years in exchange for their passage. Three weeks into the journey, the plague hit the ship, and half the people on board died, including Henri's parents. The captain made me his cabin boy. He said I had to pay off my family's passage. Oh, I worked all the time, cleaning his room, getting his food, his clothes, hauling buckets of coal. And if I did anything wrong, he threw me in the hold for hours. How dare he? I belonged to him. You mean he made you a slave? Henri, that's terrible. Thank heaven you're here now. How did you do it? Moses and I went to the dock to pick up parts of a printing press that had come over from France. We went down into the hole to get the parts. There was Henri, on the floor, behind bars. I thought they came to hurt me. But Moses got him out with the handle of the printing press. It was amazing. It was just what needed to be done. But how did you get him off the ship? We found the crate of parts, and Moses took the parts out, hid them under straw, and put Henri in instead. We closed the crate and carried it off the ship. Right under the captain's nose? Right under his nose. But we had to wait another month to find other parts for the printer. I'm still not sure it was a good trade. Then I wrote to Dr. Franklin and asked to have Henri work in the print shop to pay for his room and board. Dr. Franklin said yes, but then he did something very bad. What? He told me I must learn to read and write French and English. <laughs> the speaking you have, but the reading we have to work on. See, work on, it work. Speaking of which, I must get back to my work or it will raise suspicion. Lieutenant Brampton was by here earlier talking about the tea party and telling Master Wheatley, if Boston's going to cause trouble, Boston's going to pay the piper. That only makes sense. Whose side are you on? I didn't know there were sides. We're all the king's subjects. Maybe you're a subject, but I'm a citizen. I have rights. Doesn't Phyllis have rights? You know what your problem is, Miss Phillips? You think too much for a girl. And you talk too much for a gentleman. Phyllis, I need a printing press. I've got to get the word out. 
James, until Moses can fix the wagon, we're stuck here. The city is swarming with soldiers who would like nothing better than to arrest us for your tea party. Take this, James. Tom Maloney published my poems. I can use his press any time. Mr. Maloney? Tom Maloney? Open up. We're friends of Phyllis Wheatley. There's no one in there. Today's the Sabbath. The Lord's Day. Well, the Lord helps those who help themselves. Remember, Phyllis gave us the key. Ladies first. At last, a sign of manners. <laughs> Redcoats. We have to work fast. Where'd them kids go off to? I've been busy doing my chores. I'm sure they're around here somewhere. Nigel! Basil! Taunt! On your feet! Those little troublemakers have run off! The city is under martial law. The breaking curfew. We'd better fetch Lieutenant Brampton! Oh, no! I've got to warn them. I'll bet they're the same brats who got away during the tea riot. But they won't get away a second time. Keep going, Henri. Aye, aye, sir. The sun's set. Good. It's time to spread the word. What's wrong, Sarah? James, are you really an orphan? I heard you tell the soldiers before. It's true. I was a tiny baby when it happened. Mother and father didn't have one of Dr. Franklin's newfangled lightning rods. Our house was struck and burst into flames. It burned to the ground. I was lucky. A neighbor pulled me out in the nick of time. Dr. Franklin's lightning rod has saved thousands of lives. When I was old enough, I sought him out. He offered to take me in as an apprentice, and I've been working at the Gazette ever since. I'm sorry for complaining about a silly locket, when you've lost so much more. That locket meant a lot, huh? My father gave it to me before he sailed for America. When it was around my neck, it was like having him near me, always. He went up the Ohio River to explore new lands. When he returns, Mother will join us here, but we haven't heard a word from Father in nearly a year. You're worried about him. See this? It's beautiful. It's my mother's ring. So, you see, I know just how you feel about the locket. James, I'm done! Grab a stack, Henri. It's time to go! Must you do this? You'll only make things worse. I have to. Why? Because, as Dr. Franklin's friend, Edmund Burke, said, an Englishman is the unfittest person on earth to argue another Englishman into slavery. In summary, my lords, Benjamin Franklin, the deputy postmaster of His Majesty's colonies, is a traitor. The proof is in his own words, his own writings. And for this treachery, I ask that as a minimum, he be stripped of his position as postmaster and that he bear the stigma and shame of a scoundrel, disloyal to king and country. <laughs> From the bottom of my heart, I thank Mr. Wedderburn for everything he has said against me. What kind of trick is this? My gratitude is sincere. You've answered a question which has troubled me since boyhood. But you have finally put my mind at ease. The question is fundamental. And when my fellow colonists arrive at the same answer as I, a great empire may fall. More treason. 
Mr. Wedderburn says I'm a traitor, but this is not true. The question he has answered for me is thus, am I a British subject or am I the citizen of a new nation, a country distinct and different from England? And today I declare my answer, I am not British, I am an American. And man can only betray his own country. My country is no longer England. My country is America. Let's put one here. Hey, you! Halt! That's an order! Run! We pray Moses has that axle fixed. Henri, I think we may have overstayed our welcome in Boston. How do we get past those red coats? Follow me. Look out! <laughs> Must have fallen off a cart. Come on, men. We have to catch whoever's hanging these posters. Are you all right, Henri? Which one of you said that? James, Henri, are you all right? Whoa! Quick, we have to get out of here. Too late. Everybody inside. Wagon is good as new. We must leave town right now while it's still dark. So my men and I are riding past this print shop when I hear voices coming from inside. So I ask myself, what's someone doing in a print shop at this hour on a Sunday? You know what I told myself? I said, printing these. You have this all wrong, sir. These gentlemen are interested in my poetry. They wanted to see where it was published. Poetry? You? What do you take me for? Show them, Phyllis. Yes, let's hear this poetry of yours. Descend to earth, there place thy throne. To succor man's afflicted son, each human heart inspire. To act in bounties unconfined, enlarge the close contracted mind, and fill it with thy fire. Right. So you're a poet. But I still believe these runts have something to do with spreading rebellion. And I aim to find the evidence. Tear the place apart if you have to. And if I find so much as one poster, it's jail for the lot of you. You. Me? What's your name? Sarah Phillips, sir. Phillips, you say? I served under a Major Phillips during the Seven Years' War. Major Phillips is my father, sir. Is that so? Then you're an Englishwoman, Miss Phillips. It's your duty to tell me who made these posters. The truth now. Your father would expect you to tell the truth to an officer in the service of his king. I... 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 Spill it, girl. Well? I'm waiting, young lady. Where are my manners? You must be half frozen riding in this cold weather. I'll fix a pot of tea on the Franklin stove. There, the fire is stoked. We'll have hot tea in half a tick. Um, uh, now what was that you asked me? Something about posters? Nothing, Lieutenant. The place is clean. No sign of them signs. Oh, I don't have time for this. Come on, men. The rabble-rousers are out getting away while we're dilly-dallying with children and poets and tea. Quick, to the wagon, before they come back! Phyllis, how can we ever thank you? Keep fighting for freedom, that's how. Now be off. I'll keep watch until you're safely gone. Thank you. For what? You know. 
I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. You saved our hides. James, I'm very tired and I'm cold. <sighs> I'm going to make a gentleman out of you yet. And I'm going to make an American out of you. Yeah! Yeah! Moses, good. That looks great. Dearest Mother, so much has happened, I hardly know where to begin. Your latest letter brought the shocking news from London. It's terrible that Dr. Franklin has lost his position as postmaster. But praise the Lord he didn't end up in jail. Or worse. James, cut out that racket. A little more, Moses. Good. Would you please stop that noise? I'm trying to concentrate. Go ahead, James. It's finished. Sarah? What is it? The boys have a little something for you. For me? A thank you for saving us. Here. For me? Moses made it. It was my idea. It's beautiful. You like it? I love it. But where in the world did you get the gold? Are you sure you like it? Your ring! It's the greatest gift I've ever received. All right. These colonies are troubling with England and Boston. This is not Massachusetts, you say. True. This is Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. But trouble moves round. Leave your politics on board. And don't pick up any politics ashore. September 1774. Dearest Mother, please give my best to Dr. Franklin. As he may have told you, Parliament's response to the Boston Tea Party has not been warmly received. The colonies have sent representatives to Philadelphia to attend a Continental Congress. Uh, no thank you. The first gathering of leaders from each of the 13 colonies. They intend to draft a formal response to Parliament. There is so much beauty here. It's not difficult to understand why the people are passionate about their colonies. And passions, as you know, can make men's blood run hot. By giving Canada the Ohio River Valley, the lives lost 11 years ago during the French and Indian War were lost for nothing. But Parliament's demand that Boston pay for the tea they destroyed is perfectly reasonable. The tax is not reasonable. Only a Tory would think so. I thought Tory was a colony. You know, like if a person was a Tory, they were from Tory. Like a New Yorker is from New York. Sarah's not a Tory. Colonists who defend Parliament are called Tories, a nasty name on this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> I must learn to be careful what I say, since my opinions are not always popular. Sam, it's vital these pamphlets are distributed in Boston immediately. The pamphlets need to be read while the British warships are still there, with cannons pointing at church steeples. John, even I wouldn't accuse the British of targeting church steeples and I consider myself an expert at stirring the pot. You're right, of course, it's too much. But we must get these pamphlets into Boston. We must! You gentlemen have a way of agreeing that makes it sound like you're arguing. <laughs> Your pamphlets are nearly done. Sarah, Henri, James, you remember Mr. Samuel Adams? Yes, sir. We were there in Boston the night of the tea party. A most splendid protest. The people should never rise up without doing something worth remembering. 
And this is Mr. John Adams. The same John Adams who defended the British troops who fired on our patriots at the Boston Massacre? James, that was many years ago. Oh, Moses, the lad is right. I did defend the British soldiers, and they were found not guilty for a good reason. They weren't guilty. And our patriots were? They simply stood up for what they believed. I think it was very brave of you, Mr. Adams, to defend unpopular men in the midst of friends and neighbors who wanted to see them punished. I had justice on my side. The men involved in the so-called massacre were not patriots. They were a drunken mob spoiling for a fight. It was a case of self-defense. Facts can be stubborn things. If I had been there, I would have been with the patriots. Son, I admire your heart, but you must learn to distinguish between a patriotic act of protest and mob rule. The tyranny of the people can be just as brutal as the tyranny of the crown. The pamphlet looks good, John. Now all we need is a way to get them into Boston. How about you, James? Here's a patriotic act. Get these to my wife, Abigail. I would, but I've agreed to assist the scribes during the Congress. Since the harbor's closed, British troops patrol the roads, stopping and searching every carriage. There will be danger. Abigail is going to meet the convoy well outside Boston. The danger will be minimal. I'll go. You? You don't even believe in our cause. Maybe not, but I believe in adventure. I could take Henri with me. No one would suspect a thing. Sarah is right, and Henri is a stout, able young man. Right, Henri? Ugh. Good. Then it's settled. I'll notify Abigail by courier. You have to learn to be aggressive if you want to be a journalist. I think you were very nearly rude to Mr. Adams. I was to the point, nose to nose. You were as busy giving your own opinion as getting his. I like Sam Adams. Sam is a man of action. This is a time for action. Hey, who's that? Whoa! What have we here? Stand right where you are! I was looking for my shipmate. I'll be on my way. I offered to buy you a drink. I don't drink. That it? Or is you wouldn't join the toast? Me, Parliament, rot the wretched louts! Where are you going? I don't know my way at night. Oh, all right already. Look, I don't want any trouble. Let me go about my business. You are my business. I'm worried about you out in the chilly night air. He needs a warm coat of tar and feathers. No! <laughs> Let me go! Stop! I can't believe I'm going to miss this. I can't believe you'd want to have anything to do with it. If you were a gentleman, you'd put a stop to it. Imagine how silly he's going to look covered with tar and feathers. He'll look like a giant barn owl. Hooty hoot! Hooty hoot! I'm Hooty the Sailor! <laughs> Isn't this more of a story than that poor unfortunate sailor? What story? We're loading wagons. These supplies have been sent from four different colonies. That's a story. I had the impression the colonies considered themselves separate countries. Uh, they did, until Parliament closed Boston Harbor. If they can do it to Boston, they can do it anywhere. <gasps> Stop! What is it? It's the Barn Owl on parade. <gasps> Let me go! Leave me alone! What is my crime? That I disagree. Now that's a story. I want to see what happens next. Hold on, Henri. We're leaving soon. The wagon master said the roads out of Philadelphia are easier to travel with this moon. Hoody hoot! Hoody hoot! Hoody hoot! Hoody hoot! On the same city street, at the same time, I witnessed an act of compassion as strangers donated food for people in need, for people they have never met. Yet, I also witnessed a callous act of brutal bullying, and James is swept up in it. <laughs> Stop! No! <laughs> Let me go! <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
in large type across the top. Hooty Hoot gets the boot because he looked like a barn owl after they tarred and feathered him. And they kicked him when they cut him loose. Get it? Hooty Hoot? Boot? I don't think so. Moses, he had it coming to him. Remember what John Adams said about mobs? What does Mr. Adams know about the newspaper game? He could learn something from the author of that pamphlet he's sending to Boston, Novangelis. Now that man is a writer. Novangelis is John Adams. It's a pseudonym, meaning he writes under an assumed name. John Adams wrote a government of laws and not of men? That's John Adams? The very one. Maybe I should write using a... Pseudonym. Yeah, I'll call myself something modern. Dagger Quill. All one word but capitalize the Q. Chatter Quill would be more like it. The lesson here, James, is less about the name and more about the message. Mr. Adams is a very wise man. You would do well to learn from his example. Now get this paper stock over to Congress. <laughs> you will let me write a story about the Congress for the Gazette? Only if you study the issues. Learn about the men arguing the various sides. Deal! That boy. I forgot the paper stock. Dearest mother, this land is even more spectacular than father has described in his letters. But the people I have met are most uncommon. They desire to learn what is going on in the country, and their willingness to share with their fellow colonials gives me hope for mankind. I could choke half of them with my bare hands. Don't they understand the suffering that's going on in Boston? Patience, Sam. We will make the case with facts stacked one upon another like bricks. Soon we will have an argument so strong it will be impervious to attack. On our second day, an old man brought his sheep to the convoy. He explained he was too old to continue herding sheep. He had given most of his flock to his daughter, but he wanted to give the rest to the blockaded city of Boston. At first, our wagon master didn't want to accept the flock. It would have slowed us down too much. But I had an idea. All right, troops. I know nothing of sheep, but I know soldiers. I depend on you to assist me, Lieutenant. Yes, General, sir. Quit fighting with the Lieutenant. You there, big horn. If you behave, I will give you all ranks of honor and names of valiant French knights and musketeers. It is essential at the outset to determine our method of voting. Who is that at the podium? Him? That's Patrick Henry. Population of the larger colonies. What say you? Hear, hear! Point of order! At the provisional meeting of the Stamp Act, we voted by colonies. One vote each. Yes, we're all equal. No! Outrageous! Who is that standing up? Delegate Dwayne. He's from New York. What say you to that, sir? The matter of the vote has not been decided. That's John Adams. Him, I know. Let's make a deal. I'll tell you everyone I know, and you tell me everyone you know. I know everyone. Everyone? Who's that? John Jay of New York. Now please, I'm trying to listen. As we set about our business, I remind everyone of our purpose. We are here to re-establish harmony with Great Britain. We're not here to provoke Parliament into further action against us. Hear, hear! Outrageous! Gentlemen, come to order. I have just received a message by courier that British warships have fired cannon upon the city of Boston. <gasps> Church steeples have fallen. There is panic in the streets and some number of dead. As we near the end of our last day on the road, we are met by a most marvelous lady and her driver. She is the wife of the Massachusetts delegate, John Adams. Abigail Adams is so much more. You would like this lady very much. Welcome from all the good people of Boston. And you must be Sarah, 
Forgive my brazen husband, that Mr. Adams, sending a girl on such an errand. You must thank him for me. It has been a wonderful adventure. But I must ask you, we heard along our journey that Boston has been fired upon. Is this true? Heavens, no. General Gage sent troops to Cambridge and took arms and powder stored there. Patrols on the road stopped supplies from entering the city. But actual warfare? God save us from that. Has any word come from England? Anything new from Parliament that might provoke violence? No. General Gage can act under his own authority. He claims he seized the powder and guns to prevent violence. However, if he finds these pamphlets, it would be sedition. That could land us all in jail. Sedition? That's like treason. You have nothing to fear. I won't let anything happen to you. I promise. Please put everything in my carriage. I know how to get the pamphlets into Boston without anyone going to jail. My squadron! <laughs> if I follow the Marsh Road into Boston, no one will think twice. Young man, that's brilliant. Tell me what happened in the Congress. Well, I found the delegates at Carpenter's Hall arguing over what to do about the Intolerable Acts. One group wants to demand Parliament repeal the Intolerable Acts, while the other group wants to ask the King for his help. Who are the leaders? The Firebrands. That's what the Moderates called them. Are the Massachusetts men, John Adams and Sam Adams. Write the names down. Who are the Moderates, then? Who speaks for them? Our own delegation. Can you believe it? Shame on Pennsylvania. Mr. Galloway sounds as if he were a member of Parliament himself. Good job, James. Excellent reporting. You have all the facts. Why are you so glum? Because they just talk and talk and talk. Why won't they fight it out and be done with it? Let's say a prayer of thanks we have men who aren't so quick to fight. The moderates won. They're going to petition the king to fix it with Parliament. It could be weeks before there's any news. Moses, let me do a story on the sailor that got tarred and feathered. That's real news, patriotic and funny. I know where you can find the sailor. Maybe you should talk to him and still see how patriotic and funny you think it is. You want to ask Mr. Parker questions for the newspaper? Yes, doctor. He's in a great deal of pain. He'll have to stay in bed for a month, maybe more. He's hurt bad? He can't be. I saw him. I saw him stand up and walk away. When a person is tarred, the tar is like hot oil. They boil it. Tar burns a man's clothes onto his skin. You mean like hot candle wax and you peel it off and... Worse. When you peel the tar off, you peel the skin away. Then there's the risk of infection, which I'm afraid has already set in. But they were patriots taking a stand. They were criminals who used the cause to beat him and rob him of his hard-earned pay. But they were shouting slogans against Parliament, and they sang a liberty song. Did they respect Mr. Parker's liberty? You want the real story? Go ask him a question. I... I don't think I want to. The facts, James. If you want to be a reporter, you must have all the facts. Tears are salty. That adds sting to the wounds. One tear leads to more hurt and more tears. It's a cycle of pain no man should inflict on another for any reason. Who is it? It's Moses. I brought the young man I mentioned earlier. Could he ask you a question or two? Yes. Is there anything I can do? These wagons headed toward Boston? Somebody got an answer for me? Yes, they are. They were loaded in accordance with the law of the king. By the sound of that voice, you're a ways from home here, Missy. Mother, I am sorry to say these British soldiers were far from gentlemen. Two of them held muskets at the ready. They talked among themselves, deciding who would ride which wagon. They intended to sell the goods and pocket the money for themselves. Sir? My father is a British officer. Really? 
An officer, you say? Which one of you would like to sign for the wagons? I'm sure General Gage will want to know who took the supplies. General Gage? Uh, see, we didn't know these goods were... Uh, she's not the daughter of... We don't need to make an issue of who her father is. Just sign. We don't have time to take the wagons now. There aren't any newspapers or pamphlets here. I swear on the King's health. There are no printed or published works in these wagons. Move on, then. All right. Stay quiet until we know what we're up against. Lieutenant, keep your eye on the six-man lava cannon. Colonel, have we heard from the Indian scouts? They are the famous shadow warriors. You cannot see them until they are right beside you. Yes, sir, General, sir. They sound like sheep. It could be Indians. They make noises like birds and bears to fool the enemy. They must have taught the rebels how to do it. Let's get out of here. Keep moving. We will find a large field to engage in a proper battle. After Henri delivered his squad of sheep, he returned the dog he called Lieutenant to the old man. We rode back to Philadelphia on horses from the stable of Abigail Adams. I shall miss her. Safely back in Philadelphia, I made my way to Mr. Adams with a letter from his wife. Thank you so much. I worry about her there, in harm's way. She asks you to write more often. Yes, I must. If you would include a message for Dr. Franklin in your next letter to England, tell him I am as heartstrong as headstrong. I am convinced by this Congress that America will support Massachusetts or perish with her. I will tell him that. John Adams arranged for us to see a bit of Congress in action. Mr. Adams said it best. The distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and New Englanders are obsolete. I am not a New England man. I am an American. We are Americans. Yeah!